Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Evan Weiner, and we're going to talk about 1964. This talk came about uh, because I had nothing to do after, <laughs> after the coronavirus uh, hit the New York area. And I was sitting there, and I'm saying, you know, I got to uh, do something. And I decided what I was going to do is write some new topics. And a uh, good many of these topics I've talked about in other talks. So I said, you know what, why don't I do this? and uh, put it together. So uh, that's what I am doing. This is the first time I'm doing uh, the 1964 talk, but it's pretty easy to do. Um, 1964. 1964 is probably the start of the swinging 60s. Yeah, you had 1960, 61, 62, 63, but 1964, a lot of things happened. Now, Kennedy becomes president in 1961, but 1964, as you see, uh, the baby boomers, um, the first of the baby boomers would become adults. And uh, here are the adults in 1964 who turned 18. And of course, Donald Trump and George W. Bush and Bill Clinton. And of course, the three of them have one thing in common. They all became president. They were all born in 1946. That is the first class of baby boomers that happened in 1964. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 signed into law in July of 64 by Lyndon Johnson, which outlawed discrimination based on race, uh, based on color, based on religion, based on sex or national origin, uh, prohibited unequal of, age. of voter registration it's requirements and racial segregation rules in employment and public it's accommodations. Now, no, it's, it's, uh, now, it's online. Yeah. Now, anyway, uh, the 1964 yeah. Civil Rights Act was not perfect. The 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, the problem with that was... Uh, didn't deal with women education. That would not be fixed until 1972 when Title IX was passed, signed into law by Richard Nixon. That is Lyndon Johnson, July of 1964, signing the Civil Rights Act into law. Uh, behind him is Martin Luther King and that tall, good looking guy, a congressman from New York, John Lindsay, uh, back in uh, 1964. In I'm not quite sure if you want to, Jay. Uh, in 1978, John Lindsay. Uh, I had a scoop with him. He was running for Senate State of New York, and it led me into a radio career with WNEW Radio. It's a stringer in the New York suburbs, all thanks to John Lindsay. Uh, so there is Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act. Uh, a couple of weeks later, a month later, Vietnam War essentially starts. Congress passes the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. That gives Lyndon Johnson the right to take any measure he believed was necessary to retaliate, and to promote the maintenance of international peace and security in Southeast Asia. Did not maintain any peace. It started a war and it started about eight years of public discourse in the United States. And there is Johnson uh, signing um, the Gulf and Tonkin resolution into law, which gave him that power. Uh, in the summer of 64, some of you in the New York area may have remembered the riots in New York City up in Harlem. Riots in Philadelphia, riots in Chicago, Jersey City, other places throughout the United States. Some of that rioting in 1964 reminiscent or was, oh, or the 2020 riots this year reminiscent of what happened uh, in 1964. And there is Harlem. Uh, and Minx Menswear and uh, Save Bar and Leeds, Stetson Hats and Dutch Masters, Master. Ronnie Kovacs' Master. favorite cigar. Uh, and there's another uh, vision of um, rioting elsewhere around the United States. And these guys came to America, the Beatles, uh, John, Paul, Ringo, and George at John F. Kennedy Airport, uh, Idlewild Airport, uh, coming in from uh, England uh, in February of 1964. And this guy, Cassius Clay, Cassius Clay would win the heavyweight championship of the world. Cassius Clay would then immediately become Muhammad Ali. We'll get into that uh, when the collision of cultures uh, part of this talk takes place. And there is, uh, there is the only guy that Howard Cosell felt to share the stage with, El Comandante, uh, Fidel Castro. Castro uh, outlasting John Kennedy, outlasting Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, in about his fourth year as the head of Cuba at that point. 
And uh, there's Nikita Khrushchev, and Nikita Khrushchev did not last uh, through 1964 as he was ousted as the head of the Soviet Union in October of 1964. Cyprus had a war. Uh, Cyprus, uh, the independence from British rule in 1960, saw a tension between the island's Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, uh, and by 1964 there was a war uh, in Cyprus. And there you see some of the uh, troops uh, during the war in Cyprus. And of course this, some of you might remember the New York City World's Fair in 1964, which opened in 64, lost a lot of money, they tried to recoup it in 1965. The Unisphere is still there. Some other mementos or, or landmarks are still there. But for the most part, uh, this 1964 World's Fair, Walt Disney tried, ran all kinds of experiments there, which would end up in Disney World eventually. Now let's talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And we're going to go back almost 100 years. Uh, the Civil Rights Act ended segregation in public places, banned employment discrimination, except for women on college campuses, uh, women professors who were looking for tenure and were told, you're just not going to get it. Why? We don't have to tell you. Uh, as I said, eight years later, they fixed that loophole in the Civil Rights Act. So it ended employment uh, discrimination against uh, people on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Uh, again, there is Lyndon Johnson, there is uh, Martin Luther King, uh, both there after the signing of this landmark legislation. Now, let's go back to the Civil War and back to uh, Andrew Johnson, who was uh, the President of the United States. And there were some constitutional amendments that did um, take, did happen. Um, which included abolishing slavery, making former slave citizens, and gave all men the right to vote regardless of race. Remember, the United States was based, in terms of voting, on land ownership. If you own land, you could vote. If you're a woman, you couldn't vote. Uh, it gave all men the right to vote. It didn't give all women the right to vote. It just gave all men the right to vote. Um, and this is some of the uh, scenes with uh, Andrew Johnson there uh, back uh, that was illustrated uh, in the 1860s. Many states decided, hey, you know what? We don't trust these people to vote. You know what? A lot of these people are illiterate, so they use combinations of poll taxes, literacy tests, and other measures which were designed to keep African American citizens disenfranchised. And there was uh, enforced segregation through quote unquote Jim Crow laws. Uh, and uh, there was violence from the white supremacist groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which gained uh, strength after the Civil War. And uh, here's a cartoon about the poll tax. And uh, if you wanted to vote, you had to throw your money in there. Uh, this was NASP from uh, the 19, 1870s. The Civil Rights Act of 1875. Ulysses S. Grant was uh, still the uh, president of the United States, was the last notable major piece of legislation related to Reconstruction, which was passed by Congress, signed into law by Grant, uh, and also Andrew Jackson, believe it or not. These included the Civil Rights Act of 1866, four Reconstruction Acts of 1867 and 68, three more Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 71, and three constitutional amendments between 1865 and 1870. It would all stop when Rutherford B. Hayes became president in 1877. So there's Grant, uh, who was, of course, the general uh, in the Civil War for the North, uh, the victorious Grant, who defeated Lee, Robert E. Lee at Appomattox. Uh, but by 1883, everything is gone. The Supreme Court rules in the civil rights cases uh, that the public accommodation, hang on, let me just let somebody in here, okay. The uh, public accommodation sections of the act were unconstitutional. They basically said Congress, they didn't have control over private people or corporations under the Equal Protection Clause. And that ends the civil rights movement officially in 1883. And there would be a long struggle, decades, well, decades and decades struggle to get this Civil Rights Act 
And a lot of the pieces of the 1964 Civil Rights Act were in these legislations, uh, which were struck down by the Supreme Court. And that was that. Now, this is Mobile, Alabama. I was in Mobile, Alabama for uh, Mardi Gras. And, uh, no, that was for a different thing in 2007. And um, there is a museum in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, it has all kind of relics of the South, uh, including a Klansman uh, uniform. But I was struck by that sign, colored entrance. Because in those days, between 1883 and 1964, if you were an African American, you couldn't go in with the white people in the South. You had to go into the color entrance. Uh, or you couldn't drink out of a water fountain. Um, that was your colored water fountain. And uh, white men, colored men, this is where the white women, colored women, where if you wanted to get something to drink, they set up different areas. And, uh, part of a baseball talk I do, I talk about Bill White and some others in the 1950s uh, with Jim Crow and how they were very resentful about Jim Crow in the South. And a lot of the Major League Baseball teams had um, Jim Crow problems. Uh, yeah, this is about the baby boomers. So we're going to get to the baby boomers in a second. Uh, but we got to get to uh, other things. So uh, anyway, so... Uh, this was all going on. Uh, again, uh, Jim Crow, more demonstrations in the South, uh, far more demonstrations in the South. And there was Brown against the Board of Education of Topeka. And Brown against the Board of Education of Topeka became the landmark Supreme Court case in which the justices unanimously ruled that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. And the baby boomers were growing up in this, well, if you're born 1964 to, or rather 1946 to 1964, you were growing up with this kind of law in the land. You had Leave It to Beaver. You had all these shows on TV, Ozzy and Harriet. Uh, if there was very little African-American people on TV, there was Nat King Cole, and he couldn't even get sponsors for his show. So the Civil Rights Act of 64 is taking care of all this. And this is the uh, Little Rock decision uh, with the nine going to school. Uh, Central High School in Arkansas, and the governor, Orville Fabus, called in, in the National Guard to, black, uh, to block the black students' entry into the high school. That was on September 4th, 1957. And then that got Dwight Eisenhower's attention. Eisenhower had kept out of this for the most part, but this gets his attention. Uh, later that month, Eisenhower sent in federal troops to escort the Little Rock Nine into school. It drew national attention to the civil rights movement. And there is Eisenhower talking about the civil rights movement in the Oval Office. Uh, and here's the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Uh, it isn't a major act, but it's an act of 1957. And it sets out protection of voter rights set out in the 15th Amendment of the United States Constitution. That would be taken care of in 1965. The Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice empowering federal prosecutors to obtain court injunctions and interference with rights in a Civil Rights Commission within the executive branch to investigate discriminatory conditions and recommend uh, corrective measures. Nothing ever happened during the Eisenhower days. Absolutely nothing happened. It would be left to John Kennedy to clean up after Eisenhower. Now, one of the purposes of the bill was to increase the number of registered black voters in the South. Only 20% of black voters were registered uh, in the nation, and the, low, and the numbers were much, 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 much lower in the Deep South. And there is Eisenhower signing the 57 bill into law. Now, among the things that happened, Federal inspection of local voter registration polls by appointed referees, which would oversee Southern elections to ensure that African Americans were permitted to vote. Penalties for anyone who obstructed someone's attempt to register to vote or vote. Extended the life of the Civil Rights Commission, which previously was limited to two years. The commission would oversee voter registration and practices and the uh, prosecution for interfering with court orders regarding school desegregation. I'm not sure all of this has been settled 
by 2020. Lots of people have come since then, and we still hear about voter suppression in certain parts of the United States. And that was supposed to be gone in 1957 and 1965. So here's John Kennedy. John Kennedy takes office on June 20th, 1961, and he is the one that is supposed to uh, go ahead and introduce civil rights reform in the United States. But really, he doesn't do very much. Uh, the first two years he sits on his, uh, he, he basically sits on his uh, hands and doesn't do anything. Uh, Kennedy sought legislation which gave Americans uh, the right to be served at facilities, which are open to the public, uh, hotels, restaurants, theaters, retail stores, and similar establishments, and also greater protection for the right to vote. He doesn't do anything. Of course, he's cut short on November 22nd by break, and it's left for Lyndon Johnson to move the ball and to get this done. So Lyndon Johnson becomes president on November 22nd, 1963, and he does try to uh, move the ball. And uh, he would do so eventually uh, by July of 1964. And Johnson had to threaten a lot of people. Of course, he was the Senate Majority Leader as well back in the 1950s. So he knew where the bones were buried. And if you've read any, any biography of Lyndon Johnson, he did not want to get on his wrong side. And he jawboned people, he threatened people, he pushed people, and he finally gets the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed in both houses and onto his desk in July of 1964. So this is what happens with Lyndon Johnson. It bars unequal application of voter registration requirements, outlaws discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, in motels, restaurants, theaters, all other public accommodations, prohibited states and municipalities from denying access to public facilities on grounds of race, color, religion, national origin, encourage the segregation of public schools, authorize the attorney general to file lawsuits enforcing the act and expanded the Civil Rights Commission, established the Civil Rights Act of 1964, pre prevented discrimination by government agencies who uh, received federal funding, happened, to, it was great in theory, but it didn't work out necessarily. Just ask women, women particularly who graduated high school prior to or before 1972, because women were still denied education, higher education, and basically were told you could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, you could be a secretary, or just go to college, get your MRS, and then raise kids, because that's all you're gonna do. Um, again, it would take eight years for women to catch up to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Six titles in this, voters' rights, public accommodations, desegregation, public facilities, desegregation, public education, uh, Commission on Civil Rights, non-discrimination in federally assisted programs. Um, and it was supposed to solve everything. Whether it solved everything or not is in history books now, and to some degree, we're still living the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, the Supreme Court struck down the Supreme Court, uh, the uh, Voters' Rights Act of 1965 see what's happened since then. And there is Martin Luther King, all smiles. And Martin Luther King talked about that. He says the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is nothing less than the second emancipation. 99 years after, 99 years after the end of the Civil War. But it didn't really help in the streets. As you can see, there was rioting in the streets. Uh, and there's cops putting down the rioting in the streets in 1964. Segregationists who were angered by the Civil Rights Act took to the streets as well. They attacked African-American demonstrators across the South. One of those demonstrators, the Congressman John Lewis of Georgia. Decades of police brutality capped off by several incidences in the summer of 1964 led to a series of racially motivated riots in New York, Philadelphia, 
Chicago in Jersey City. Seems like 56 years later, we're kind of playing off the same script as we did in 1964. We weren't the only country. The United States wasn't the only country going through civil rights problems. That is a bitch beach in South Africa. And uh, it says, white area only to swim, blanket, GBAP. Well, that's it, white area only. Uh, please boycott apartheid in sports. 1964, the Olympic movement. Apartheid is raging in uh, 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 South Africa. And on August 18th, 1964, the International Olympic Committee was banned from the 1964 Tokyo Olympics because South Africa, they weren't asked to end apartheid. They were just asked, just condemn, condemn apartheid and you could come and participate in the Olympics. They refused to do it. South Africa was thrown out. Lyndon Johnson's a war criminal. No destruction in Vietnam. This, of course, is about 1967, 1968. But the roots of this picture start on August 7th, 1964. It starts earlier than that. In the late 1950s, during the Eisenhower administration, Vietnam had split into two areas. One, North Vietnam, the communist North Vietnam, the other, South Vietnam. Now, at this point, you got a whole bunch of things going on. You got the Cold War going on right now, the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. And you probably remember some of you who are old enough hiding underneath your desks or going to fallout shelters hiding under the desk because the nuclear bomb was going to drop at you. I remember asking Miss Alexander of PS-151 in 1964, why are we going under our desks like that? Remember we went like that? I mean, if the bomb is going to come, it's going to kill you. So you might as well just be comfortable. She looked at me. I'm eight years old at the time. She looked at me. Get under that desk. Miss Alexander was 133 years old. She had blue hair. She had a white uh, blouse blue skirt and a napkin tucked under here in case she had to blow her nose. Anyway, the Cold War anxieties dictated if North Vietnam and the communists prevail, the rest of Southeast Asia, the McNamara theory, Robert McNamara, uh, the rest of Southeast Asia would fall. Thailand would go. Laos would go. Cambodia would go. It would all be communist. So we better get in there and do something. Now, there was a civil war uh, between the two sides. French were involved in, and the French decided, hey, this isn't for us, we're getting out of here. So when John Kennedy takes office in 1961, he makes the vow not to allow South Vietnam to fall to communism. And there is Robert McNamara, the former Ford Motor Company executive who knew nothing about being the Secretary of Defense, but all of a sudden, he's the Secretary of Defense, and he's the guy feeding John Kennedy information, in Lyndon Johnson information. Of course, we wouldn't know about the information, we being Americans, until Daniel Ellsberg printed the Pentagon Papers in 1971 about just how entrenched we were going to get in Vietnam and how it was Robert McNamara's brainchild. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, well, it was prompted by, quote unquote, two separate attacks on two Navy destroyers, the Maddox and Turner Joy on August 2nd and 4th. Uh, they were stationed in the Gulf of Tonkin in waters that separated Vietnam from a Chinese island of uh, Hainan. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution told Lyndon Johnson to take all the measures you have to do uh, against um, the forces that are trying to harm the United States and to prevent further aggression by the communist government of North Vietnam. Passed August 7, 1964. That is the date that the Vietnam War officially starts about eight and a half years until it takes to the end. According to the U.S. Navy, the Maddox and the Turner Joy reported being fired upon by North Vietnam patrol boats. Doubts about the second attack on the Turner Joy emerged. The attacks would lead to the escalation of American involvement in what essentially was a civil war between the North and the South in Vietnam, and there is Lyndon Johnson. By January 1965, 5,400 men called for the draft. By December, 45,000 men were called during that year. 
the monthly draft total would rise from 17,000 to 35,000 a month by 1967. Young people starting at the University of Wisconsin, and it really wasn't even against Vietnam War, it was against Dow Chemical making Agent Orange coming onto the Wisconsin campus and recruiting scientists and the uh, students there engaged in civil disobedience and would do so again in October of 1967. It was a rapid call up. There were 500,000 men and women in Vietnam by 1968. Nikita Khrushchev, Leonid Brezhnev, Khrushchev and Brezhnev. Uh, Khrushchev uh, was the leader after Stalin and uh, wasn't too liked by 1964, and there was Brezhnev who would take his place. Back in the USSR, October 15, 1964, Nikita Khrushchev was removed from office, replaced by Leonard Brezhnev. And there is uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy. Of course, Khrushchev and Kennedy had uh, those discussions back in 1962, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And there is Fidel Castro, who I had said, outlasted Kennedy, who was assassinated outlasted Lyndon Johnson, outlasted Richard Nixon, outlasted Gerald Ford, outlasted uh, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan and uh, George W, uh, rather George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Um, he outlasted everybody. Uh, his survival skills were amazing. So here's Khrushchev and uh, Castro uh, when they were friends. Uh, in 1962, Nikita Khrushchev deployed nuclear missiles in the newly created communist Cuba, it wasn't that new at that point, it was two years old, within striking distance of Key West, 90 miles away, and Miami, and other major population centers on the East Coast. Now, the Kennedy administration was aware that the missiles were still only partially developed and really didn't pose uh, an immediate threat. Uh, Khrushchev would eventually be forced to remove the missiles from Cuba. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I was involved in a project in 2004 with uh, uh, a woman uh, by the name of Helen O'Donnell, whose uh, father, Kenneth O'Donnell, uh, was Kennedy's Karl Rove, chief of staff. And she had all the videos and all the tapes of the, uh, what was going on in the White House. And I heard one of them. And we took it to Los Angeles and tried to sell it to make a documentary out of it, uh, which would have been on the History Channel or something else. And uh, Shelley Saltman and Bob Block took it to their, these people uh, over on Wilshire Boulevard. And they said, we'll give you $100,000 for it. And Helen O'Donnell said, I want $60 million for it. She's still looking for the $60 million. And uh, Shelley told me her about six of the tapes. And they're really, really interesting. It would have been a historic mark, marker. But uh, Helen held out for $60 million. And uh, she was offered $100,000. And so ended that uh, eight-part series that we had uh, pitched back in 2004. John Kennedy, one year earlier, had authorized the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. And that failed partially because he decided not to use his uh, Air Force. Uh, and he publicly consented never to attack Cuba. Uh, Kennedy also agreed to take American nuclear weapons out of Turkey. And there is Mao Zedong, and there is uh, Nikita Khrushchev. And uh, around 1960, the two countries started to call each other names. Khrushchev said Mao Zedong, he's a left revisionist who failed to comprehend Modern warfare. Meanwhile, Mao Zedong criticizes Khrushchev as a, as a psalm singing buffoon. Psalm singing buffoon who underestimated the nature of Western imperialism. Those words actually meant war, and they almost came to blows in 1969 when the Soviets threatened to nuke Red China at that point. So they were. Um, they were not uh, on really good terms. There were skirmishes in 1969, border skirmishes, and uh, the Soviets under Brezhnev said, hey, we're going to nuke you. And Nixon had other things on his mind in 1969 and really didn't, didn't care too much about what was going on with the Soviet Union and China. And there is Nikita Khrushchev uh, reading a newspaper uh, after his exile. Uh, the break with China and food shortages in the USSR, they always had that 
five-year food plan, eroded Khrushchev's legitimacy uh, in the eyes of uh, the Politburo, and they were bothered by what they thought was some being an erratic guy, a erratic tendency to undercut their authority, the Politburo. And there's the guy who took his place, uh, Leonard Brezhnev. And Brezhnev immediately uh, takes um, the office and uh, lays out some plans. The Soviet people see their international duty in the support of the just struggle of the people against imperialism, colonialism, and neo-colonialism for their social and national liberation for peace, democracy, national independence, and socialism. So they are going to support, oh, Fidel Castro, Ho Chi Minh, and a whole bunch of others around the world uh, who are not being supported by Americans. We are coming out for an end of the arms race and for general and complete disarmament, for relieving the peoples from the mounting burden of military expenditures. That fell on, that fell on deaf ears in Washington with Lyndon Johnson, but this guy's ears perked up. That, of course, is Ho Chi Minh, uh, the leader of communist North Vietnam, who was involved with the civil war against South Vietnam and is about ready to get, become entangled in a war against America. November 17th, the Cold War heats up again. Soviet Politburo decides to send increased support to North Vietnam. The aid includes aircraft, radar, artillery, air defense systems, small arms, ammunition, food, and medical supplies. The Vietnamese are gonna fight a proxy war for the Soviets against the Americans in Vietnam as of November 17th, 1964, and people are beginning to pay attention in the United States. The Folkies, <laughs> people like Bob Dylan, people like, uh, uh, well, people like Bob Dylan and, and others would start singing protest songs, Pete Seeger among others, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, in Cyprus, there's a war. Uh, February 12th, the fighting between the ethnic Turks and Greeks take place. Disputed island of Cyprus, 16 people are left dead. The island's two main ethnic groups decide they're going to go at each other in 1963. By March of 1964, the UN sent 7,000 peacekeeping uh, soldiers to enforce the peace in Cyprus. Lyndon Johnson decides he's got to get involved too. That's on January or June 5th. And he moves to head off the further inflammation of the Cyprus crisis by telling Turkey, you know what, cool it. No rash military moves. We don't need a war between Greece and Turkey over Cyprus. Uh, and these guys are ready to go to war, as you can see, to war, to war. Uh, but by August 10th, 64, cooler heads prevail as the United Nations uh, broke as another ceasefire in Cyprus, and for the moment anyway, diffused the growing Cyprus, or growing crisis between the Greeks and the Turks, Cypriots, and they headed off the invasion of Turkey. The conflict would continue for years and years. That is my friend Bob Lipsight. Now, Bob Lipsight, you might know, was a sports columnist for the New York Times. Uh, he was also on PBS. He authored 11 books. Uh, he coined the phrase jockocracy, not Howard Cosell, although Howard used jockocracy. Howard would borrow words from people, people like Bob Lipsight. Anyway, <laughs> Bob Lipsight was a, was a sports writer for the uh, New York Times back in 1964, and he's covering the New York Yankees. And uh, Bob Lipsight, uh, Bob Lipsight would be in Miami in February of 1964. And the New York Times sports editor calls him. He says, uh, "He's here for driving." You know what? Why don't you go to Angelo Dundee's uh, gym? The Beatles are going to be there, and they're going to meet Cassius Clay. Now Lipsight in in his book goes into great detail of this, this meeting. So he's there and he thinks that he's just covering this thing between these four guys from England and Cassius Clay, who is, he doesn't think is gonna be the heavyweight champion. Nor does John Lennon. Somehow Lipsight 
is sent to the same room waiting a half hour with the four Beatles for Cassius Clay to arrive. And Lipside will tell you that John Lennon, in his mind, was a miserable guy. He said the other three Beatles were cool, but he said Lennon wasn't. And Lennon was really upset being cooped up in this room. And he's got this guy, Lipside, who he doesn't know. And he's telling Lipside, I don't support losers. I don't support losers at all. Don't support losers. Uh, I, my guy is Sonny Liston. I don't know why we're here. Well, there is a reason why they're here. Because Sonny Liston didn't want to meet with the Beatles. And Cassius Clay reluctantly said, I'll meet with the Beatles. So here's Lipside chronicling this thing inside the room. As he says, worlds collided on February 18th, 1964. What the worlds collided was the old guard, the new breed is coming in, here are the Beatles, and here is Cassius Clay. Now, this might have been a blip in history had things worked out the other way. The Beatles were in, uh, by this point in the United States 11 days, and Clay is still chasing uh, Liston around Miami threatening him and, and challenging him to a fight in the streets at that point. And there is Sonny Liston. Bad dude, man. Bad dude. And he's the baddest dude, heavyweight champion of the world, and he's going to take out Cassius Clay. Well, the Beatles are finally released. Cassius Clay comes in. Now, take a look at that picture, and there's a whole series of pictures. The red light goes on, and the four Beatles and Cassius Clay or all of a sudden, hey, best of friends, known each other for years, all this other stuff. Clay's first impression, Lipside said, uh, when he walked into the room, he saw those guys. He said, who are those four sissy boys over there? Uh, and Lennon, of course, was not very interested in Cassius Clay because Cassius Clay was not going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. As Lipside said, the Beatles could have been a flash in the pan. Cassius Clay could have been knocked out by Sonny Liston and his afternoon would have been wasted. But that didn't exactly work out that way. The Beatles are still around in a way. Paul McCartney's still out there. Ringo Starr is still out there. Uh, Ali was around for a very, very long time before uh, being punch drunk uh, caught up with him. And uh, it's unfortunate because uh, I dealt with him in the 80s and uh, there was nothing upstairs, unfortunately. And, 60,000 blows to the head would do it. And there I am with uh, Muhammad Ali in 1985. That's the last time I actually spoke to him. I saw him subsequently. The sad part about that, he couldn't sign his autograph. People had to tell him how to spell his name that day because the Parkinson's had kicked in so much by that point. Uh, and there's uh, Ali in 1982 with me and we're discussing some uh, other things. So. Uh, um, Ali, unfortunately, he could still talk in 1982. By 1984, he was shot. Dundee had the gym where Cassius Clay trained for his fight with Liston. It was called the Fifth Street Gym, and the Beatles were there. Clay was there. The Beatles went on to become the Beatles, world global phenomenon, and Muhammad Ali became an international statesman in some ways uh, after his boxing career. Um, and there is Angelo Dundee with my son back in 1965. Now, John Lennon may not have dealt with Ali, he eventually would, but that's Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. That comes out June of 1967. And if you look on the left side of the album cover where the 64 versions of the Beatles are, there is a cutout. The cutout is of Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston was still one of John Lennon's idols in 1967, even though he's spiraling out of control by 1967 as a drug addict. Uh, and there is the cutout of Sonny Liston that would eventually make it onto the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts, Lonely Hearts Club album. And of course, the baby boomers by this point are 21 and they're buying up Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. Um, Muhammad Ali would run into John Lennon again this is Jimmy Carter's inaugural in 1977 on January 20th. And there is Ali and there is Yoko Ono. Uh, Ali must have left an impression on John Lennon because in 1972, he wrote a song called I'm the Greatest, which he gave to Ringo Starr to sing. Of course, Muhammad Ali, I'm the Greatest. 
uh, Muhammad Ali would become a seminal figure in the 1960s uh, with Lyndon Johnson's war by refusing to serve in the U.S. military, uh, not taking, uh, not swearing into the military on April of 1967, uh, being convicted of being a draft dodger, uh, facing five years in prison, $10,000 fine. Uh, Ali said, why should I go to Vietnam? Why should I fight? Uh, my friend Shelley Saltman uh, was one of his promoters and he's for the Ali Frazier fight. And he told me that uh, when Ali called him to say, hey, can you help promote me? He said, I'm only going to do it for the money. I don't like you. I've served in Korea. And he said, Ali sat him down for about three and a half, four hours and explained to him that he was a conscientious objector. Shelley was sold. Shelley worked for Ali from 71 to 79 in the inner circle, but he left in 1979 because that became his friend. And he thought his friend was getting beaten up and that he didn't want to see him as a vegetable. So he left and Ferdy Pacherko, the fight doctor who was with him for a long time, also left. Uh, and obviously Lennon uh, had some influence or was influenced by Ali as well. Uh, in 1975 after, or 76, after he took on the wrestler, uh, in Tokyo, and the, and the wrestler Antonio Inoki kept kicking and kicking and kicking at his shins. Uh, he developed blood clots, and he was told to go to the hospital, but Ali said no. This is what Shelley was telling me. I made a commitment to entertain the troops in South Korea. I don't care what happens to me. I am going to make that commitment. And he has the blood clots, and he has a fever, but he performs, uh, does tricks, whatever he's doing, for the troops in South Korea. Then he's hospitalized in critical condition with the blood clots. He's in the hospital for a while and then he flies home. It's a story that people don't know about Muhammad Ali that he did take care of the military. New York World's Fair. New York World's Fair was a big deal. A lot of you probably went from the New York area of a certain age. Uh, that was a couple of years ago when my wife and I uh, were in front of the Unisphere. World's Fair, Robert Moses the guy who let Walter O'Malley take the Brooklyn Dodgers to Los Angeles. He was the guy behind the World's Fair. Peace through understanding. 650 acres of land in Flushing Meadow, uh, in Corona, Queens, uh, in Flushing Meadow. Uh, there were pavilions, public spaces, displays from exhibitors around the world, countries, cities, corporations, private groups. It was the first corporate World's Fair ever and would set the stage for corporate Olympics like Peter Ubrock would run in 1984. It was corporate America. They paid for everything. Kodak, Ford, and other companies. I remember uh, Sinclair Gas, Dino the Dinosaur. Uh, I remember GM there. I remember Ford Motor Company there, and a whole bunch of others in U.S. Steel, and, and it was a corporate Olympics. Uh, so a private group set up shops, display their ideas, uh, their accomplishments. They got 50 million visitors. They were 20 million visitors short of breaking even. And um, that avenue is still there at the World's Fair. You can still walk down that avenue uh, to the Unisphere. Uh, by the end of the first session, 1964, it was on the verge of bankruptcy and they used money for advanced sales, 1965, to pay off the debt uh, of 1964. The fair did run through 1965. Uh, Walt Disney, Walt Disney the, uh, was looking at the World's Fair and some of the things that ended up at Disney World or at Disneyland had their first run at the World's Fair, including uh, It's a Small World After All, which ended up uh, out at Disneyland. Uh, Walt Disney certainly profited from them. Uh, the World's Fair, um, the grounds would fall in disrepair. Right now, it's a huge parkland in Queens. Uh, one thing, when I was there last year, I haven't gone back there this year, one thing that uh, struck me, the Mets play on the other end of, uh, of the World's Fair grounds uh, at uh, formerly Shea Stadium and their park today. Uh, there are no baseball fields in the park. It's all soccer fields and it's all cricket pitches. There are no baseball fields, believe it or not, in the World's Fair grounds with the Mets being, you know, 1,700 yards away, something like that. Uh, but the World's Fair ends and um, 
it was left in disrepair. That thing has been sitting there since 1965. They are talking about renovating the New York State Pavilion. If you remember the movie Men in Black, you saw that in Men in Black. Uh, those towers aren't working and uh, there are all kind of fencing so you can't get in there. And they're talking about spending $100 million to restore the old New York City Pavilion. Well, that was the year that was. That was the week that was, the first satire review ever on TV. Um, that was on NBC. And I remember watching it when I was seven and eight years old. Uh, I remember David Frost on that show. David Frost did both TW3 in England and then would fly to New York. Among the people on there, Nancy Ames, Henry Morgan, uh, Woody Allen, Steve Allen, Alan Sherman, Buck Henry, Dick Knoll, Elliot Reed, the songs of Tom Lehrer at England, Phyllis Newman, Bob Dishy, Mort Saul. Remember Mort Saul? He actually had a ticker tape machine in his house so he could follow the news, early invention of the internet. And uh, Jerry Damon was the announcer. Uh, that was the week that was. And that was the father of the Smothers Brothers show. And that was the father of Rowan and Martin's Laughing. And eventually Saturday Night Live. And eventually you would see The Daily Show and, and the old Stephen Colbert show uh, all came out of that. And there were a couple uh, up on YouTube. There were a couple surviving TW3s. And they're really, really funny. And they were really cutting satire. One of the writers on that show is a guy by the name of Tom Meehan. Tom Meehan is one of the few people that I ever regret not keeping up with. He lived in Rockland County, New York, and uh, his brother was uh, John, was a Rockland County legislat legislator from uh, Ramapo, and his other brother, Bob, was the Rockland County DA. And one day, John said, I want you to meet my brother, his brother, Tom Meehan. And uh, Tom Meehan, when I met him, had met, uh, had written Annie, and we had gotten along for a little while, and then you know, I dropped out of sight, he dropped out of sight, and I looked back at that, that's the one I should have kept up with, because I would have met Mel Brooks, because he and Mel Brooks wrote Spaceballs together, and also wrote um, the producers on Broadway, uh, Tom Meehan, and uh, if anybody's interested, I have a uh, article I did on Tom Meehan back in 1978 about how Annie came about. So he was part of, that was the week that was, which was television's first ever in the United States satire show. That was the week that was. It's over, let it go. Oh, what a week that was. That was the week that was. Well, 1964 was the year that was. Uh, featured the start of the Vietnam War. There was the presidential race between Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater, the conservative, which people, people were really afraid of him to the point where the Johnson people did the daisy chain nuclear uh, bomb commercial. Goldwater would end up getting annihilated by Lyndon Johnson in the November 1964 uh, election. Uh, and uh, it would also set back the Republicans and they would recalibrate, of course, uh, with Richard Nixon becoming the standard bearer in 1968. So the civil rights struggle continues in the United States, even though the Civil Rights Act of 1964 signed into law by uh, Lyndon Johnson, who observed after signing the Civil Rights Act that uh, the Democrats had lost the South for generations to come, that the Democrats were not going to do well uh, in Georgia, in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Louisiana, in Texas, uh, and all those states. And Johnson was uh, absolutely correct about that, all because of the uh, Civil War. Um, Beatlemania. Beatlemania and Muhammad Ali. Beatlemania and Muhammad Ali. As Lipside said, what if the Beatles fizzled out once they went back to England? What if Sonny Liston won? How would cultural history have been different? Would the Rolling Stones ever have come over? Yes or no? Would Dave, Dave Clark Five be here? Herman's Hermits with the Who, Led Zeppelin. Would any of them have made it had the Beatles failed? Because remember, Cliff Richard failed in the United States, and he was the big star in England. 
There was a civil war in Cyprus. There was a change in the uh, USSR. Uh, as far as the baby boomers were concerned, 1964 started their adulthood. And people like Donald Trump went to for them. And George uh, Bush went to uh, Yale. And Bill Clinton also goes to Yale. And Bush would also go to Harvard for his MBA. And uh, other people would start their adulthoods in 19. Uh, 64. Uh, the Civil War starts. Lyndon Johnson has that war in Vietnam, which would ultimately end his presidency in 1968. 1965 was kind of a quiet year. Also in 1964, Lyndon Johnson probably saved uh, the United States space program because people were ready to claw back on it. And even though John Kennedy promised to be at the moon or go to the moon by 1969, Congress was ready to take money away. Lyndon Johnson said, no, the money is going to be there. We're going to the moon. And more so than Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson was probably the most important man other than Warner Von Braun getting people to the moon because he believed in getting people to the moon. Goldwater would go back to Arizona, would become a senior statesman uh, in the Republican Party, and would go visit Richard Nixon in 1974 to discuss where he was in the impeachment process, and maybe, just maybe, Nixon should start considering a way out of the presidency in 1964. So that was the week and that was, that was the year that was. The New York World's Fair opened, the baby boomers turned 18. There was a world out there that was changing. As I said, the swinging 60s probably started in 1964, not 1960 because those were kind of sleepy, quiet years, even though John F. Kennedy was the president and there was this alleged uh, Camelot in the White House and there was young Jackie who was the first lady and all of that. But there was world-changing events in 1964 that impacted people well into the 21st century. And you could make an argument, even today, July 15th, 2020, the events of 1964 are still impacting us. Any questions, any comments, any criticisms, any remembrances? You can all undo your microphones now. Hello, hello, hello. We'll just raise, uh, raise your hands and I'll get to you. Let me uh, unmute you. Ask what? all to unmute. Evan. Yes. Evan. Hi, uh, this is Harriet. Hi, Harriet. Say hello to Brenda's cousin. Hello. Say hello to Brenda's cousin. My wife's Harriet. She's in uh, Florida. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, Muhammad Ali says that the North Viet or the North Vietnamese never did anything against him. So why should he go fight them? Yeah, that's what he said in 1967. Cool. Yeah, but then five years. He was not the champion of the world, and he lost a lot of income. But he also had Parkinson's disease. Yes. Yeah, he, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't speak to him after 1985. Uh, 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 is Bruce still here? Or Bruce? I think Bruce, uh, I guess Bruce left. Uh, everybody say hello to Drew. Uh, Drew, best on your recovery. I hope that uh, you uh, get over the... Uh, the virus uh, as quickly, and I'm sure everybody else uh, says the same thing, that uh, hopefully you'll be uh, better in a couple of days. Anybody else? You. Yeah, uh, Evan. Yeah, Ken. Evan, just, um, I just read this yesterday. Um, there was one uh, um, thing that you forgot, and it had to do with sports. And in 1966, game two of the World Series, Jim Palmer became the youngest pitcher to pitch a shutout in, in the, the World, World Series. Series against Sandy Koufax, who retired right after that, right after they, right after they got swept by the Orioles. That was 1966. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's what 1964. I said. 19... 1964 no. was the last year of the New York Yankees dynasty. 
And, oh, true. Uh, That's true also. Yeah, and then my old And they buddy, lost to the uh, Cardinals. 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 And my old buddy, Yogi, uh, who I spoke at his museum, uh, was fired right after the World Series of 1964. Anybody have any remembrances of the World's Fair? Yes. I went there with four children, and we spent the whole day there into the evening, and my husband got worried. He, he was working that day. He couldn't go with us. And then he called the police to find out what happened to us. <laughs> we, were, we were safe. And my youngest daughter was four years old, Nina. I learned so much from Harriet from these talks. Uh, we, we, I, I was, uh, she lives in Florida as senior residence, and uh, I think I was doing a 1968-69 talk, and she was telling me that uh, her oldest, she was worried that she would lose him in one of two ways, he'd go to Vietnam or he'd flee to Canada. And I never knew that uh, until, and nor did my wife, until uh, I did the talk down uh, in Florida. So uh, I learned a lot. So I never knew that uh, Jerry, called, Jerry called the cops to look for you. The one thing, the one thing that I remember reading about the World's Fair in 1964 was, is that it was not authorized no, it by wasn't. the by the World's Fair Commission because they had just had a World's Fair in Seattle in yep. 62 and they were planning the Montreal one in 67 and they were and they were giving New York New York's World's Fair was supposed to be in 1972 but because Robert Moses was such a well, I, uh, a a uh, uh, a stick in the mud to uh, 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 to, to to be nice, uh, um, he decided no, we're going to have it in 1964, and that basically ruined the whole World's Fair concept. Well, you know. I don't think Robert Moses cared about the World's Fair people. Robert Moses no, cared, no, he didn't. Robert Moses cared about one one person. Robert, Robert Moses. Moses. Yeah. In fact, uh, we got the Teutonic Parkway thanks to uh, Robert Moses. Robert Moses never drove, but Robert Moses was the guy who who thought that the automobile was the thing. Uh, in Brooklyn, there used to, the Brooklyn Dodgers were named after trolley Dodgers, people in the streets who were dodging trolleys. And uh, it was Robert Moses along with GM and, and Firestone and, and a whole bunch of other people that literally put the trolleys out of business, not only in Brooklyn, but in Los Angeles and in other Troy. places. Um, you know, there are still some trolleys around San Francisco and Philadelphia and a couple other places, but um, <laughs> Robert Moses, um, there have been books about him. There have been a lot of books about him. I've read a book about him, yeah. Yeah, so uh, anyway, so that's, uh, you know, anyway, anybody else? Robert Moses ruined the Bronx with the Cross Bronx Expressway, cut the Bronx right in half, and uh, made a lot of traffic. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, yeah, I, I guess. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I guess that's that's what he did, so. Yeah. You, know, you Evan, forgot about the NBA, Evan. The N NBA in terms of what, 1964, about Red Arback going to the Soviet Union uh, or trying to go to the Soviet Union because he hated the Soviets. And uh, he had that uh, all-star team that ended up uh, in uh, Egypt. And he wanted to beat the Soviets so badly. He wanted to beat them in Red Square. And he sets up an exhibition with the, with the Boston Celtics and some all-stars thrown in. And uh, Nikita Khrushchev basically said, um, no, no you're not coming in. The State Department actually got everybody visas to go there, but it was cut short because, um, it was just cut short because the uh, Soviets decided, you know what, these guys are just ravaging through Europe. We're not going to do it. Um, we don't want to lose. But uh, they, 
you know, Soviets did win the, the uh, Olympics in 1972. But Red was upset that they were beating supposedly, the college kids. Supposedly. Oh, there was two things. First, in, in the 64 championship was the first time that uh, Bill Russell matched up against yeah. Will Chamberlain. Yep. And yeah, then the Warriors. Yeah, yeah. And the Celtics won that series, four to games to one. You know, uh, Bill Russell, 1961, in fact, I was talking to a woman in Chicago today because she wants me to do an athletes in protest. Bill Russell in 1961 and his teammates were not served at a restaurant in Lexington, Kentucky. They were uh, supposed to play a preseason game and they said, uh, we're not getting served, we're leaving. And Red Arbeck pulled them out of there. Uh, and that was the second uh, protest, first protest was uh, a little earlier that year, a guy by the name of Walter Beach, who was a defensive back with the Boston Patriots. And um, the Patriots were playing a preseason game in New Orleans. And Walter Beach said, uh, I want to be treated like the white players in New Orleans. I'm not staying across town. And Billy Sullivan fired him and said he was a troublemaker. Eh? That was 1961. So Russell's, uh, Russell and his teammates' uh, protest uh, came about. Well, in the fall of 64, yeah. the Celtics 69, had, the, yeah. Yeah. had the first all African-American starting five yep. in NBA history. Yep, and then there was also uh, UTEP uh, and, and that story uh, where the, the all American, well, all the African, all five Africans beat Adolf Ruff. Yeah, in, yeah, uh, that Kentucky, could, uh, so. yeah. So we're getting yeah. off the beaten path here, so. Well, anyway, Evan, 64. Anybody? Um, yeah, Evan uh, here, it's, it's the Eric other, and Sam. Wait, who, who, no, what, Eric, were you, who, who wants to speak? Hold on, can somebody else want to speak? Yeah, Evan, it's, it's Eric in San Francisco. Yeah, hi, Eric. At baseball hi, Eric. Yeah. Hey, thank you for, uh, thank you for including me on the email. It was, it was really enjoyable. Anytime I get a chance to hear about the Beatles, I'm a Beatles freak. And, uh, you know, you know, the whole thing with Ali, I mean, that's just a, it's just, it's a great story. Well, what I think a in, lot of people. It's in sorry. one of Lipsight's books. Okay, um, I'll talk to you about it. Um, you know, I know some of that. I don't think I knew the detail to what you talked about, but I certainly have seen all the photos and stuff. But, um, you know, what I think a lot of people don't know is that the Beatles actually on, on one of their tours, I guess it was 65 or the last one in 66, they actually refused to play. That was South Jacksonville in, in 64. In places where they would, wouldn't yeah. allow blacks in there. So that's just really, you know. Yeah. And sure. your thing about uh, that was the week that was, I mean, that was just a, you know, I was, you know, I, young. But I absolutely remember remember watching that, and you know Nancy. I don't remember the name of her, her last name. Ames. Right, right, right. Who did that song? And and I think that's where Tom Lehrer got started too, right? Hey Walter, you're a big <laughs> Tom Lehrer fan. What do you do? You know? I don't know if Walter. If you want Walter, you know what? You're probably right that uh, you know what? I think he did the masochistic twist before he, that. Well, I know that he was, I think he was involved in that show. I've got both of his, you know, albums. I mean, it's just some unbelievable stuff. I mean, that guy was, and you know, he's a, he's like a mathematics uh, professor in Santa Cruz. I mean, that was his vocation. Yeah. So. And he quit. He quit after those two albums. Never anyway, it was just. Publicly again. Yeah. It was, it was just good hearing about that. And Lyndon Johnson, I mean, I'd. I think I'm one of the relatively few of our era who actually like Lyndon Johnson. Um, you know, people just, you know, pin Vietnam on him and it's certainly fair enough, but boy, what he accomplished was just monumental. Yeah, he did, he did a lot. And, and uh, uh, you know, my friend Richard Hull, who uh, worked for NASA, uh, said that it was Lyndon Johnson who uh, basically uh, was, the, was the one who, uh, uh, Got the money up there and, and, and did everything. So, you know, he, he and Who he was uh, there. In, uh, well, they say he did, they say he did what Kennedy couldn't have gotten done. Yeah. So. Well, with the civil true, rights movement. True, true. Two things, two things, and then I'm going to leave. Um, one was the, um, the, in 1968, in the time between the election of, of uh, old tan rested and ready, 
and the inauguration of, of, of Tricky Dick, um, Johnson feared that Nixon would cancel the space program. So he went to, so he went to Congress and he said, I want the space program funded through 1976. Well, the space program, uh, okay, so Congress said, we'll give you half the money. We'll give it until 1972. That's when the space, that's when the Apollo program ended. Well, actually it was uh, in 1970, it was February of 1970, that they yeah, but, cut the money. But, but they, it, it, they cut, they allowed it to go to 72. And one of the reasons they cut the money, listen to this reason, TV ratings. Right. The TV right. ratings between Apollo 11 and Apollo 12. TV ratings. That's what right. cut right. the, the, the space program. But, but the fear was, the fear was, let me finish my first point here. The fear was that yes. Um, that that uh, uh, Nixon was going to cut the program right straight up, you know, December, uh, January 21st, 1969, he was going to announce the program being cut because he hated Kennedy and all this that, and the other. And so there was a plan in place for Apollo 8 to land on the moon. There was, except the, the, the problem it, was they didn't have a lunar module, it wasn't ready. Right, right. But they, they could have gotten it ready in a hurry in yeah, that no, I, six I asked, week. I asked Dick about that, he said there was no way. He said they just they okay, do it. But that's the story that I heard. Yeah. Now anyway, we, okay. Now the other one, the other one was about Bill Russell. Bill yeah. Russell did not like Boston at all. Nope. No. And um, so when it came time for his jersey to be retired after he had quit playing, they did it during practice. Yep. They did it during practice, and they and they sh and and they had the Boston um, uh, photographers there uh, taking pictures of it because he did not like the fans. He hated the fans. He hated. He. he I mean, Boston was extremely segregated and extremely. Prejudicial at the time still is, but let's not go there. Anyway, so that so that's my story. Now I'm gonna go because I got. All right, eat. Ken. I'm gonna leave you with this. Get today's Boston Globe. There's a story with Bob Cousy, and Bob Cousy, who's 92 years old, apologized to Bill Russell today, saying he did not do enough to help his teammate in Boston in the 1950s and the 1960s. It's in today's Boston Globe story by Dan Shaughnessy. Anyway, that's all I got. All right. Thank you. That's Thank all you. I got. Thank I hope, you. Uh, hope you enjoyed this little stroll down memory lane, even though I'm not uh, Joe Franklin or Martin Paint. And uh, thank you for uh, attending. Uh, I got one tomorrow uh, in Montville New, Montville, New Jersey, Presidential Impact on Sports. I'm doing this again on Friday. On Saturday, I am doing the calendar year 1967, which is actually – my favorite one to do because uh, it's a year of contradictions. Uh, summer of love, yes or no. Uh, tune in, turn out. Uh, Timothy Leary on one hand and uh, you got others on, on the other hand. Uh, so uh, you got the uh, uh, people going to Vietnam stationed in Oakland before they go to Vietnam. So their last stop in the United States is San Francisco and Ed Ashbury. So they go down there before they go to Vietnam. I uh, have a story about a woman who is a banker by day and a Ed Ashbury uh, person by night. 
so anyway, um, thank you for attending. Uh, I will see and talk to some of you soon. And uh, thank you, Harriet, and thank you, Pete. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you, right. Eric. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Andrew, Drew, I hope you're feeling better. Uh, and uh, Megan. So uh, we, will, uh, we will speak to some of you tomorrow. Some of you maybe on Saturday. Some of you maybe next week. I'm only doing 11 talks in the next uh, two weeks or so. Uh, my big one is a week from Friday when I talk about uh, uh, how sports operates in the United States and how uh, since the George Floyd incident, um, things have changed uh, since the George Floyd incident um, in sports. And I get to do that next week. And hopefully I got a whole bunch of student, uh, rather uh, sports business uh, professors who are going to come in and uh, tell me how wrong I am. So anyway, thank you so much. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Evan. Okay, bye. Okay, take care of that. Bye-bye.